interesting behaviour. However, lets you know that they're telling you something. So if they are starting to be interesting, use your distraction techniques. They may need to be with a grown-up at that time, but not in a, will you go and stand with Mrs. So-and-so? Will you go and sit with Mrs. So-and-so? Will you go and do that with Mrs. So-and-so? Make it exciting, because they are getting bored of you. Your teaching may not be all that. <laughs> So perhaps up the energy level a little bit and go, oh, come with me for two seconds. We're going to go and do this in the cupboard. And off you go. <laughs> because by doing that, you will then put yourself back in control. And the children who are in your room will start to see you as the person in charge rather than the person just managing a situation. Redirection. So if they are fiddling with somebody else, if they are interfering with something on the table that you don't want them to fiddle with, this is groundbreaking. Put the goddamn resources under the table. They don't disappear. I know there are TAs that have an absolute breakdown if you move the pen tray off the table. <laughs> but put it underneath and they haven't got anything to fuss with. And then you can redirect their behaviours to where you need it to be. And that isn't about being draconian, going, all eyes on me, give me five. You do that to some of my ADHD children, they will do some interesting signs when they think it's at the same time. Think of how you can control that without it looking obvious that you are redirecting that behaviour. Because you will start to see what gets them interested. So if you're in early years and you've got them on the carpet, if you're keeping them on the carpet for more than 10 minutes, I would fiddle. I would be interesting, I've been nudging my friend, I've watched you lot all sitting here now, and you're either writing on your pad, or you're doing this with your phone, or you're fiddling with your hair, or you've gone to that zen place of, it'll stop in a moment, and then I'll be back. <laughs> we all do it, so why are you expecting a small person to be able to regulate themselves? You have to help with that. So, if you know that they cannot concentrate for that long period of time, then think about your planning, think about what your lesson structure looks like. Do you have to do more, let's go and do something else for two minutes and then we come back and do that? Because if you're going to spend 20 minutes unpicking somebody's behaviour, losing two minutes for you doing a nice distraction activity is a big payoff, I think, personally. Managing expectation. So if you're in your classroom and you know that that child will start doing this while you're talking, and nobody outside of our profession understands how irritating <laughs> this is, because I bet you've gone home and talked to your other halves and gone, they were clapping down <laughs> And they just look at you as if to say, why? Why? Why is that annoying you? And you could snap at any moment, especially when you catch their eye and they stop. <laughs> yeah, nobody outside of our profession, you can do that anywhere. Do that anywhere, and you watch teachers suddenly lose their necks. That's fabulous. But if you know that's going to happen, then manage your expectation of what you're going to do. Is that something you can live with? Because if you can live with it with one kid, could you live with it with two doing that? Or three doing that? If that's not your expectation in your classroom, then put a stop to it. Remove the things that they can tap with. Give them something, like fiddling frenzy, little bits of Play-Doh to play with. Stuff that won't get you hurt if they decide to fling it. Don't, for God's sake, give them fidget spinners because they can smash windows. But little bits of blue tap, sellotape wrapped round so they can stick it together. All sorts of stuff you can give them to get them to concentrate and not fiddle and annoy you. We use something called Doe Disco. Is there any early years, people? So we, we are a spread the happiness school. So we use Doe Disco with ours because it doesn't stick to the carpet and you don't get your cleaner giving you a filthy look. And also, it's non-triggering for ASD children. The colour is a good colour, the smell isn't too ridiculous, and it will stay soft for about eight months. It's a good investment. You get ten pots for about six quid. So it's not that expensive. If your expectation level for you is different from the TA, or the TA's expectation level is different to yours, you need to become consistent, because that's the only way it's going to work. So you have to allow some of your battles to drift a little so you can deal with the big things that you've got to deal with. So if the biggest challenge for you is to stop them shouting out, that's the thing you work on. 
You manage the other bits, but you work on the one thing that really is going on your nerves. If they're going into the hall and they can't line up, practice lining up. If they can't line up after playtime, practice lining up. It was the stuff that I used to do when I first qualified, back in the good old days, where you had a nature table, and nobody really cared what the national curriculum was. <laughs> but practicing those things are brilliant, especially when you've got interesting children, because taking them into a bigger space makes them excited and anxious all in one go. If you've, if you've ever taught early years, when you take them into the hall, the immediate thing they do is slide across the floor, or they run round going, ah! right round the roof. Well, if you know that happens, why don't you practice taking them in without that happening, so that when you go into full school assembly, you haven't got the senior leadership team staring at you with daggers, because one of yours is deciding to be really stupid at that precise moment. If you are going to practice, I would practice with your interesting children being in different places in the line. Because normally we put them at the front and we hold their hand really tightly. But they are very good when somebody else has distracted you of manoeuvring themselves to the middle of the line and you haven't worked out where they are until you've got into the assembly and they're sitting down. And it's usually when you've got visitors in. And there's you on one side and your TA on the other side, and that child's being interesting in the middle. And then you've got that choice of, can I direct them without looking like I'm directing them? So you're either sitting there going... <laughs> <laughs> and then you're trying to signal to your other half. <laughs> and you're waiting for a hymn. Hopefully something's going to happen that they will stand up, that you can walk up, but it never does. Never does, and you start to panic, and then you've got that whole problem of either you getting off your chair or sending the poor TA across that line off her chair, doing that whole crab walk. There's always a child that gets in your way and trips you up as well, so you've got Portier then killing three rows of infants. You have to think, you would not go into your classroom to do maths and English without being prepared. So if you're going into your classroom and you know you've got interesting children and you haven't prepared for it, well shame on you, ladies, shame on you. You're the professional, be prepared for it. There are some things that children will do that you can never be prepared for. And sometimes your most interesting children will actually outperform you. They will go, oh my god, look at this, I've got an audience. And then you're like, oh no, you don't quite know what to do. But what you do from that is manage it and then learn why it happened. If you don't learn why it happened, it's going to keep going on. The one thing, I, if I can get you to do, the last two things on this bit, is simplifying your requests and laughing. Because if you think about yourself when you go home, and you've had a bad day, and you've been chuntering to yourself on however way you get home, and you go in through the front door and you discover that the cat has been sick, and nobody's cleaned it up, the cat's just looking at it, and the dishwasher hasn't been emptied, and the things that you've asked to be put away have not been put away, and you suddenly snap. You suddenly have that whole meltdown moment, and the person that's with you at that time says one thing like, shall I put the kettle on? And you go <laughs> off at them. <coughs> The reality is, that's how your children are feeling on a day-to-day -day basis, minute by minute, in your classroom, if they're interesting. So if you want them to do something, there's no point doing a whole nice big verbose speech. Simplify it. I need you to sit. I need you to sit down. Sit, I don't care where you sit. Sit down. Let's not be too specific about where. Let's just get you sitting down and then I can deal with the next bit. Think about your language. If your voice is starting to sound very robotic while you are talking to them, you are losing it. So simplify how you speak. If you are going to be in control, be in control. If you don't laugh at what you see, you will take it home and be sad. So it's really important, and what we do at Waterside is that we debrief every day for five to ten minutes and we talk about all the brilliant things that have happened in the day and then we talk about all the things that have been a little bit interesting so that every member of staff can check in so that before they go home we've parked what's in our brains 
Because the last thing you need to do is take home those children in your head.